Most history is bullshit. They say that history is written by the victor. But do they write the truth? Hitler said that the victor will never be asked if he told the truth. So clearly, Hitler never intended to tell the truth about World War II. Germans were very effective at propaganda. And propaganda is usually lies. Among the lies spread by the German propaganda was how the World War II started and progressed, especially at the very beginning in Poland, in the first month of the war. There is an article just came out uh, in the Spectator of England. Poland was no walkover for the Reich. 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 That's in German. What a beautiful language. That's probably what the Assyrian sounded like. In their propaganda, the Germans convinced everybody that they just walked over Poland, that their Blitzkrieg, which became a household name, and it shouldn't because it shouldn't be used so commonly because it refers to evil actions of evil people. And they tried to convince everybody that their assault was so efficient when in fact they faced a very tough fight in Poland. The author of the article is Adam Zamoyski, who is reviewing a book by Roger Morehouse, First to Fight, The Polish War, 1939. And Roger Morehouse wrote, The victor will never be asked if he told the truth, Hitler remarked on the eve of invading Poland in September 1939. Nobody believed his claim that Germany was acting in self-defense, but they did believe his carefully crafted propaganda to the effect that the Poles were so dumb they used cavalry armed with lances against tanks. I know for a fact that these lies were taught in Canadian schools, at least in British Columbia, supposedly British Columbia, not German Columbia. The children were shown videos of Polish cavalry attacking, supposedly attacking German tanks. These were German propaganda lies meant to ridicule Poland and Polish resistance because such events never took place. The reviewer Adam Zamoyski says, in his timely and authoritative book, Roger Morehouse dispels this and other myths concocted by German and Soviet propaganda. Interesting how the Germans and the Soviets always got together. They had a secret pact before World War II, and now they have a secret pact to run oil from Russia to Germany, bypassing Poland, bypassing Ukraine, trying to benefit only the Germans, although the Germans should be working with Poland since they are both members of the European Union. But no, the Germans always like to side with the Soviets, with the Russians. And apparently Roger Morehouse trolled through an impressive quantity of unpublished Polish and German sources, as well as a wealth of eyewitnesses' testimonies from both sides to produce a balanced account of this much neglected, yet important episode of the Second World War, which is both harrowing and inspiring. There could never be any doubt as to the outcome. Poland was a poor country, struggling to rebuild a state after more than a century of partition and that's an interesting fact by itself. This is um, this is not in the article, but this whole partition thing, which happened before 1939, Poland was was overrun by three neighbors. They never had the power and courage to attack Poland one on one, and they they never won, and that's why they they never tried. But they ganged up on Poland like criminals, like gangs gang up on people. So three countries, Germany, Austria, and Russia. Again, we have the Germany-Russia connection, and Austria joined, attacked Poland, overran it, and divided it, exploiting it for the next, uh, the guy says, 100 years. So over that time, Poland couldn't progress. It became weak going into World War II. It seemed like it was fate that Poland would be weakened before the outbreak of World War II. And those three countries, Austria, Germany, and Russia, they wanted to attack Poland because 
they wanted to keep the aristocracy in power, the royals in Europe. At that time, Poland had one of the most democratic constitutions in the world. It fully supported the American independence and the stinking aristocrats in Europe, they didn't want they didn't want that happening in their country. They wanted to keep their aristocracy in power and those freedom ideas from, from the freedom-loving people in Poland were not allowed to spread into neighboring Central European countries. So that's why Poland was attacked. And after the partition, Poland was severely weakened and the economy was wrecked by the First World War and the unpromising climate of the Great Depression. And the article says that the military spending over the five years prior to 1939 was less than 3% of that of Germany. As Morehouse points out, the amount that Germany would spend to equip a single armored division exceeded the entire annual budget for the Polish army. And Poland had 700 tanks, but most of them were obsolete and they were outgunned by Germany's army. They didn't have as many planes, they didn't have as many tanks, and whatever they did have needed updating. But Roger Morehouse writes, the campaign was no walk over. That's the point. The war, the takeover of Poland was no walk over. The first shots were fired by the battleship Schleswig-Holstein at the Polish military depot in Westerplatte, and they had a 200-strong garrison, and they held on under constant shelling and dive bombing by German planes until they ran out of ammunition seven days later. On that first day, despite being taken by surprise, now this is, listen to this, the Polish Air Force managed to down 40 enemy aircraft at the cost of 29 of their own. Despite of having fewer planes and less modern planes, they were able to shut down 40 German aircraft and they lost 29 of their own. North of Warsaw, the German forces invading from East Prussia were given a bloody nose. In the south, General Maciek's motorized cavalry brigade destroyed more than 60 of the German 18th Corps tanks. Polish cavalry, which only fought on horseback against lightly armed infantry, the Polish fought against soldiers on foot and on horses. Actually, Germans used horses a lot as well. Polish cavalry never fought against tanks. That is one big fat lie, fake news. The original fake news from the Germans. And in one case, cavalry was consistently successful. In a single charge, General Anders, Polish General Anders, captured an entire battalion. Unfortunately, neither these nor many other successes could alter the fundamentals. But apparently a distinctive feature of this campaign and what followed was unprecedented barbarity from the Germans who claimed to be oh so civilized. And Mr. Morehouse rightly devotes much space to the human cost. The Luftwaffe waged a psychological war by bombing villages and towns that had no military presence or significance. They would be bombing civilian refugees, peasant women and children working in the fields. Can you imagine that? They were bombing civilians knowing full well what they were doing. The Wehrmacht, in a familiar pattern, destroyed villages it passed through for no apparent reason and exacted drastic reprisals on the civilian population in areas where it meant resistance. Basically, where any Polish units operated, after the battle was over, the German troops would come and burn down the whole village or villages and murder the civilians who lived there in an act of vengeance against the soldiers whom they could not catch. And Roger Morehouse says there was certainly little gallantry on display. Polish prisoners of war were beaten, sent to perform slave labor or shot. Commanders of units which had put up a stiff fight. Poland was putting up a stiff fight. It was no walk over. 
And that really enraged the Germans. And I think it's still enraging them today that they lost, that Poland was the stumbling block for them. That's what the Germans did. How dare you oppose the Germans? And I know they did the same thing in Holland. If a village or a town would not surrender to the Germans, the Germans would punish the civilian population. How dare you fight us? Attacking civilian population. How is that for gallantry? How is that for any war conventions? For the Geneva Convention? How is that for any human decency? And yet the German propaganda tried to make it look like the Germans are so honorable and civilized. They were far from it. Mr. Moore goes on to say that the fate of Warsaw could stand as a symbol for the whole campaign. Bombed heavily from September 1 and besieged on the 8th, it would hold out until the 28th under a hail of artillery fire and dive bombing. On a single day, September 25, the city took 560 tons of explosives and 72 of incendiaries, more than was dropped on London on any day of the Blitz. The population remained remarkably resilient and even cheerful, actively participating in building defenses and tending to the wounded. They could not know what their fate would be after the surrender, that their much-loved mayor and more than 60,000 prominent citizens would be murdered, murdered in the initial stages of decapitating Polish society. When the Germans came in, they murdered the mayor for resistance. How dare you resist the Germans? And they, they murdered 60,000 prominent citizens. Those are crimes, war crimes and the French would be routed the following summer in a shorter space of time than the Poles. The French fell sooner than Poland. Poland was no walk over. Poland lasted longer and more bravely than France, which was very well equipped to fight. Also the Soviets, who had invaded from the east in collusion with the Germans on the 17th of September, learned nothing and they too would be thrashed in a quick time a year after that. And this is what President Trump mentioned about the Warsaw Uprising during his last visit to Poland. Now, this is not the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. This is not done by the Jewish population of Warsaw. This is the Polish Warsaw Uprising, done by the Polish population of Poland. This is a different one. So this is what Trump remarked, very impressed by the resilience and bravery of the Polish fighters in that fight. In 1939, you were invaded yet again, this time by Nazi Germany from the West and the Soviet Union from the East. That's trouble. That's tough. And let them come here to Warsaw and learn the story of the Warsaw Uprising. When they do, they should learn about Jerusalem Avenue. In August of 1944, Jerusalem Avenue was one of the main roads running east and west through this city, just as it is today. Control of that road was crucially important to both sides in the battle for Warsaw. The German military wanted it as their most direct route to move troops and to form a very strong front. And for the Polish Home Army, the ability to pass north and south across that street was critical to keep the center of the city and the uprising itself from being split apart and destroyed. Every night, the Poles put up sandbags amid machine gun fire and it was horrendous fire to protect a narrow passage across Jerusalem Avenue. Every day, the enemy forces knocked them down again and again and again. Then the Poles dug a trench. Finally, they built a barricade. And the brave Polish fighters.